أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا ولما رأى المؤمنون الأحزاب قالوا هذا ما وعدنا الله ورسوله قالوا هذا ما وعدنا الله ورسوله وصدق الله ورسوله وما زادهم إلا إيمانا وتسليما من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عاهدوا الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا ليجزي الله الصادقين بصدقهم ويعذب المنافقين إن شاء أو يتوب عليهم إن الله كان غفورا رحيما ورد الله الذين كفروا بغيظهم لم ينالوا خيرا وكفى الله المؤمنين القتال وكان الله قويا عزيزا وأنزل الذين ظاهروهم من أهل الكتاب من صياصيهم وقذف في قلوبهم الرعب فريقا تقتلون وتأسرون فريقا وأورثكم أرضهم وديارهم وأموالهم وأرضا لم تطؤوها وكان الله على كل شيء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وصلى الله وسلم على عباده الذين اصطفى اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن عين لا تدمع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن بطن لا يشبع ومن دعاء لا يسمع we commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending blessings and salutations upon the masterpiece Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and all his household, starting with his wives, his offspring, and all his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. And may he bless all those who have struggled and strived to preserve the deen and to convey it in such a way that today it has come to us. And may Allah bless us all. Amen. Also at the very outset, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in such a way that he makes us from amongst those who can follow the candle through and pass it on to our children so that they can be rightly guided as well by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam. Firstly, I'm very happy to be here in the, the beautiful country of Mauritius. It's the first time I have come here. And really, it's a trip that's long overdue. And although it will be short, but by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I ask him to make it beneficial for all of us and to make it a means of our entry into Jannah. 
by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being happy with us and making us from amongst those who love one another solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This evening's topic is a very interesting one. Help me get out of my mess. So we need to know every one of us is sometimes in some form of difficulty. We feel sometimes that we are in a mess and we feel sometimes a great difficulty. What is the mess we are in? Everyone has different problems. Some people have a problem where they've lost a loved one and death has taken place as it always does unexpectedly and therefore they find themselves in turbulence in what they may term as a mess. Is it a mess? That's a question. Then you have others who ask for trouble themselves. They ask for trouble themselves. You know, as I came into Mauritius, one of the brothers told me that, you know, here the people are very lighthearted and they love your humor, you know. So I said, well, if that's the case, perhaps we can flavor it a little bit more with it. So let me get cracking, mashallah. You know, people don't like to listen. Sometimes you have parents warning us and we don't like to listen to their advice. Then we get into a mess, but it was us to blame because you were told. Didn't I tell you? The answer is yes. You told me, but you know what? I didn't like to listen. It reminds me of a man in one of the Indian villages. He wanted to go to the city. Now, when you go to the city, there are very sharp, shrewd people in the city who are busy watching and waiting for foreigners who don't know what's going on in order to make money from them. Or sometimes people who look like they come from the village in order to con them out of their money. Like back at home in Zimbabwe, sometimes what they do, they stand outside the shop in a dust coat, you know, where, they, where there is window shopping. They stand outside the shop in a dust coat and they say, uh, which one do you want? So an unsuspecting person says, I want this one. They said, don't worry, I get it for you at discount. It says $29.99, I will get it for you for $20.99. Oh, $19.99, just give me $20. You give them $20, they are gone. They never ever come back. You walk into the shop, what happens? They say, but who did you give the money to? To one of your own people. It was your fault. Why didn't you listen? You need to walk in and buy it properly. When you are asking for something that is too good to be true, sometimes it's your fault. Do you know, sometimes there is a business deal. They tell you, come and join here with us. And you know what we'll do? We'll multiply your money in five days. Wallahi, if that was the case, that same man would not be sitting in front of you. Why must he multiply your money? Let him multiply his own money. But people don't understand. They come and they tell everyone, look, you can multiply your money. It's your fault. It was too good to be true. Now you're in the mess. May Allah protect us from getting into the mess on our own. So the story I was telling you, this man from the village decides I'm going to the city. They warned him and told him, you know, if you are going to go to the city, there are many shrewd people there. Take company, go with someone, you know, in shaytana ma'al wahid wa huwa min al abad. Shaytan is closer when you are traveling alone to you because then there is no one watching you. Your iman will block you from doing something wrong. But if you drop your guard for a moment, you might fall into the trap. Whereas when you are two or three traveling together, there is a less likelihood of you falling into a mess. May Allah protect us. So this man says, no, I'll go on my own. So what? You think I'm a foolish? I can rob them. Who are they to rob me? I will rob them. So they left him. He went. He arrived in the city. First time in his life, he saw a building 20 stories. Wow. Looking up. One, two, three, four, five. Six, he's counting. So one con artist saw that this man is from the village. He's counting. See, he said, hey, what are you doing? The man says, I am here looking. He says, what, you think looking is free? You think to look is free? He says, what do you mean? I need to pay? Yes, you need to pay. How many floors did you look at? You need to pay 10 rupees for every floor. Now there were 20 stories, isn't it? So he says, I only saw three floors. He says, okay, give me 30 rupees. The man took out 30 rupees and gave them. He still didn't understand what happened to him. When he went back to his friends that evening, they told him, how was your first day in the city? So he says, it went very well. I cheated someone of 170 rupees. He says, well, how did you do that? He says, I saw all 20 floors, but I only paid for three. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. You see? He is in a mess because he did not listen to advice. So sometimes the moral of it is we are in a mess because we did not listen to advice. People told you, they warned you, they told you everything, you did not listen. 
but still by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can retrieve that 30 rupees. Today we are laughing at someone who lost 30 rupees. We lose 300 rupees every day. And then what happens? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. May he grant us goodness. So the first point I'm saying is let's listen. Let's understand. If you're in a mess, depending on what the mess is, you need to ask yourself, is it a mess? Let me get back to the first point I made mention of. If you've lost a loved one and your life has suddenly come to a standstill, your son has passed away, your daughter has passed away, your husband, your someone, your wife, your mother-in-law. Well, in that case, some might say, Rahmatullahi alayha. You know? But sometimes what happens is you've lost a person who's so close to you and so dear. And you think to yourself, my life is at a standstill. My beloved brother, my beloved sister. That's not a mess. Your Iman is in a mess. That's what it is. We are the only religion who teaches wal qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi min Allahi ta'ala. Have you ever heard another religion teaching that good and bad fate needs to be surrendered to and we need to be pleased with it? No other fate teaches you in the depth that Islam does. So for that reason, remember, when you surrender to the law of Allah and you surrender to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes what you would have considered a mess is actually not a mess, but it is actually a point of your entry into Jannah through sabr. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya amanu sta'inu sabri wa Seek assistance through patience and through prayer. For indeed, Allah is with those who bear patience. Allahu Akbar. Allah is with those who bear patience. You will find the assistance of Allah rushing in your direction because you are a person who had sabr. And sabr is such a great act of worship. People sometimes confuse a certain happening in their lives, a certain occurrence in their lives. They confuse it as being a mess, whereas all that is required of you is sabr. And Allah sometimes only allows those whom he loves to engage in sabr because he loves them. Because he says in the Quran, Indeed, Allah recompenses those who, has, who have engaged in sabr without limits. The reward of those who engage in sabr is limitless. It depends on you. You know if one man lost a child and another man lost a child of the same age, one might get a bigger reward than the other because he was closer to his child and he is feeling the loss more, but he is still thanking Allah. Ya Allah, if that was your decree, I'm not competing with you. If that's the case, look at how massive the reward one will get. Whereas the other, maybe he wasn't close to his child. Maybe he did not live with his child. He will also have a reward, but perhaps not of that magnitude. Allahu Akbar. Then how can we look at the death of someone in our lives as a mess? Whereas it is an opportunity to earn paradise. This is why the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Inna Allaha idha ahabba abdan ibtalahu. We've heard the hadith many times. When Allah loves someone, he tests him. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, you're going to have problems in your life. Because life was not meant to be perfect. We did not come into this world in order to lead a perfect life. If that was the case, what then would be the value of paradise? Paradise, Allah created it to be perfect. So why would Allah create this life as well to be perfect? People would not want to go onto the other side. And you know what? It's very true. We have a sickness where those who think that we were born in order to lead the happiest and most blissful life ever, they have lost the plot. They haven't even understood that there was one creature of Allah whom Allah loved more than everybody and anybody else. Who is that creature? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If leading the most blissful life was the best thing possible, he would have not had a single obstacle in his whole life. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So don't be fooled. The more difficulties you have, the more rejection you might face, 
the more issues you may face in your lives remember it is an opportunity for you to look at it in a specific way and for you to understand it is actually looked at by others as a mess but me as a muslim i look at it as an opportunity to get closer to my maker allahu akbar may allah make us closer to him so don't think in life there will be no car crash in life everything will be smooth and your health will never fail in life you will never lose someone who is dear to you in terms of death you have to lose people because who is going to die first that's the question the question is not whether you are going to die or not we know we're going to die who's going to die first there is something known in the books of inheritance as al mawtul jama'i which means collective death where many people die together you hear the whole family perished may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease i was in qatar not just a few days ago there was a huge fire in qatar those of you who've been following the news there were people who lost children but i want to raise one point the point is there was a couple that i don't know but i read about what happened to them they had triplets they had triplets three children you know what are triplets inshallah and they lost all three within the space of one morning imagine what they must have gone through imagine what type of mental emotional trauma that they might have been facing and may still be facing it is only belief in the secrets of your maker that would take you out of that type of distress and it requires a true believer to actually sit and say alhamdulillah ala kulli hal ya allah if that is what you wanted then there it is we will not compete with you muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam lost his child ibrahim and all his boys were lost in childhood or infancy what did he say he says inna lillahi ma akhadha wa lahu ma a'ta wa kullu shay'in 'indahu bi ajalin musamma indeed for allah is what he has taken away it always belonged to him and for allah is whatever he has given in the first place it was always his and everything that allah has created he has created with a fixed time none can change that time amazing so this is why we say my beloved brothers and sisters you've lost a loved one don't worry allah will recompense you bear patience that patience is better for you allah knows what is good for you and what is not but sometimes you have people who are clever jacks you know what's a clever jack as we said at the beginning the quran tells you something we say ashhadu alla ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh i bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides allah and i bear witness that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his messenger and his prophet his slave but still we don't understand or we don't want to understand and we even if we do understand we don't want to obey the instructions of those whom we claim to follow if that's the case who is to blame wallahi we are to blame so now you have muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam informing you telling you if you do this and this then your life will be this and that and if you do that and this then your life will be in that way if you lead your life in a specific way you will see happiness if you lead your life in another way you will see sadness my beloved brothers and sisters there is only one solution to everything to return to what allah and his rasul have taught that's the only solution that's the only solution today let's take a look at marital crises what happens you find a wife telling you you know what my husband is flirting my husband is a womanizer or he is what is going wrong there they haven't understood khutbatul haja what is khutbatul haja that short sermon that is recited on a lot of occasions including in most cases on the occasion of nikah we hear it again and again it has in it ya ayyuhalladhina amanu taqullaha twice and it has in it ya ayyuhannasu taqu rabbakum once O oh, you who believe fear your rabb fear allah and o oh, people at large fear your rabb be conscious of your rabb the term taqwa be conscious of your maker 
if you are married and you are conscious of your maker, what can go wrong? What can go wrong? Nothing can go wrong. You're conscious of your maker. Your salah is in order. You're at home most of the time. No flirting, no nothing. You can throw away your phone if it irritates everybody else. But today what happens? We're on Blackberry. Mashallah. What's Blackberry? For your information, it's crashing. And this WhatsApp and mix it and everything else. Poor wife is sitting right next to you looking at you. So now what does she do? She says, okay, I'll also go on WhatsApp. It's fine. So she starts. The two of you, no discussion. Half the night is over. And after that, you sleep facing that direction. She sleeps facing the other direction. Two in the morning. Beep, beep. Have you heard that? Two in the morning. And then if the wife had to say, my darling, I need a bit of water. You're saying, get it yourself. And if the phone goes, beep, beep. Where's the phone? We quickly reply in response. Who was that? Even if it was a jinn from Africa, you wouldn't know. Allahu Akbar. Allah protect us. Why is it now whose life is in a mess? What we are doing? I want to tell you what we are doing. You see the sisters? My sisters, don't be offended. I'm about to say something very practical. You see they have a book, mashallah, cuisine. You know, when we cook in the, in the kitchen, mashallah. So you have, alhamdulillah, the cakes, the gato that you'd like to make. Am I right? You'd like to have so many different things, le pain, and whatever else you'd like to make, mashallah. And it needs to come out in a specific way. So what do you do? Let me see the book. Every single thing that it says there, let me buy it and purchase it, put it aside. Why? I don't want a mess. Am I right? Don't want a mess. I need to follow the ingredients. Then when I get all the ingredients, I need to mix it in a specific way. When I've mixed it in a specific way, I need to thicken it until it gets to a certain dough. If you're making a cake, for example, then I preheat the oven. Why? Because that's what it says. And then I put it in and I watch. I know of some women, subhanallah, they will sit at the oven and watch it and wait for it. See, the sisters are laughing. Can you hear them? They know what I'm talking about. They sit and watch it. They check it. Too much pampering is also not good. Pamper your husband. Don't pamper the cake he's going to eat. Allahu Akbar. If you pamper your husband, and you haven't pampered the cake, he'll say, no problem, we'll buy one or you can make it again. But if you pampered the cake with no pampering the husband, even if it's the best cake, he won't even want to eat it. Allahu Akbar. You see the mess we're in. You see, we, things have gone upside down. Now the point I'm making is, we will follow the instruction to make a cake to the T so that nothing goes wrong with the cake. But we won't follow the instructions to lead my life properly so nothing goes wrong with my life. That we won't do. You see? This is why we say it. we're in a mess. You want help out of your mess. You need to read the book of ingredients known as Quran and Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and follow it properly just like you follow the ingredients of that Indian delight book. Yes, Jalebi. You know what's Jalebi? It's not everybody's business. Wallahi, they make it. It's quite difficult. I've seen it happening live. And sometimes it comes out of flop first few times. The women hide it to pretend like they didn't make it because they don't want you to see that something went wrong. There you are. Allahu Akbar. No foolish behavior. Sometimes thinking, talking of fools, there were two men who wanted to enter a parking lot in a high rise building. So what happened? The one man says, you know what? They won't allow us here unless we enter with vehicles. So you have to say you are somebody, you know, you have to say someone, say your name, that this is who I am and the guard will open. So the first man, he goes in. So the guard says, who are you? He says, I'm the director of electricity. He says, okay, he opened the boom, let him in. The moments later, the next man comes in. He didn't know what to say. The, the guard asked him, who are you? He says, I'm the director of electricity. The guard says, how can there be two directors of electricity? So this man was a quick thinker. He says, haven't you heard one for 110 volts and one for 220 volts? <laughs> so the guard says, okay, what a fool, what a fool. So we cannot be conned when you, you need to know what you want in life. You cannot be conned by other people. People will con you that, you know what? Are you a Muslim? Well, there's a mandir. The Muslims go to the mandir. Is that true? The answer is no. You need to know a few items bare minimum. Al-Ashya, they are known as Ma'lumum min ad bid-darura. There are certain items in your religion that you have to know yourself so nobody can fool you and tell you 110 volts and 220 volts. They can't tell you that. Why? Because you know, hey, hey, hang on, electricity is electricity. There you are. Allahu Akbar. 
So when I, when I heard that for the first time, I told myself, I wish I was a guard, at least for one minute. I would have at least caught someone lying. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. We need to be guards of our own deen, our religion. Sometimes we're in a mess because we have married two things that are not supposed to be married. You see, a man, what does he marry? He marries a woman, isn't it? Today on the globe, you have men marrying men in other countries. And you have women marrying women. They don't, they don't understand. Allahu Akbar. Someone told me, someone actually told me that a member of their family had a sex change. Do you know what's a sex change? A woman decided to change and become a man. So she went and had the operation. And this is a true story. I'm not joking with you. She had an operation and she had her pills and whatever and she had hormones. She grew a beard and she wanted to now be known as uncle instead of, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Meaning she wanted to be known as a specific term and so on. But believe me, I started reading about it because we need to guide people. We need to help them out of their mess, isn't it? And I started reading about it and I found something shocking just two nights back. What was shocking? Let me tell you what was shocking. 99% now, I've added a bit more. It doesn't go up to 90, but I think the others are lying. So I'm putting it up to 99. 99% of those people who have done that, they're very sad and they live with regret and they have so much inner emotional fighting that they are suicidal half the time. And when they get to old age, they are actually really people who are complete cabbage. Allah says, God is why? Do you know what they were taught? People will come to you and tell you, you know, you're a woman, but in the wrong body. God made a mistake. This is what they're saying on the globe. God made a mistake and you are a woman, but in the wrong body. You're, you're in the body of a man. So change it. Do you know what I said to someone? I told them, it is better for you to be in what you think. This was a non-Muslim. It is better for you to be in what you think is the wrong body than to be competing with the maker of that body. It's easier to think, hey, you know, I've got masculine features, but I'm a feminine. Than to go forth and to fight with your own rub. Can you win the battle? You can't win the battle. This is why we say sometimes people have a lot of bad luck, a lot of bad luck in their lives. So what happened? You suffered a loss. There was a burglary. There was a car accident. There was a death. Everything happened one after the other. You know what we say in our language? Someone did black magic on me straight away. Let me run to that peer. And that Maulana and that person because someone did magic on me and poor Maulana, he tells us, yes, there is a jinn that was sent to you by your family member. That's a typical one, typical, typical classic. Believe me, it was not your family member. You are accusing an innocent person. Even if a religious man told you that it was that man, he has been lied to by the jinn. That's what it is. And if he had spoken to the jinn and told the jinn, do you know what? You are lying. The jinn would say, change the story. Change your story. And then if you still say you're lying, the jinn changes the story again and again. So this is why if you know the Quran, you will realize and understand that that man cannot tell you who exactly did what to you. And in most cases, it is not even black magic. It's just a spate of a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at Yusuf alayhi salam. Did he consider his life a mess? Never. But to us, it was the biggest mess. If we look at it with the eyes we have today. What happened to him? Young boy, his brothers were jealous of him. We are still fortunate. When you're born, your brothers are still happy, mashallah. I hope they are, mashallah. You know, we don't want people to come up and say, hey, you know what, one more mouth to share here. One more mouth to share our money with, you know. We don't want that. I think, mashallah, people get happy. You play with your little brother, little sister. You're excited and so on. Then they were jealous. They planned to kill him. Then they just, then they chased him away. They took him to a far off land. They put him into the pit. You know the story. After that, he was picked up as though he was going to be helped. He was not helped. He was sold. Look at the mess. If I was looking at it with my eyes or you with your eyes, and we took religion out of the equation for a moment, we would say this man's life was a big mess. But Allah said, oh my worshiper, I have chosen for you such a high rank. The only way to get there is through X, Y, and Z. Allahu Akbar. If, he wasn't, if there was no jealousy, they were not going to take him 
away. If they did not take him away, they were not going to put him in the pit. If he was not going to be in the pit, the people were not going to have picked him up. If the people had not picked him up, they were not going to sell him. If they didn't sell him, he wasn't going to go into that minister's home. If the wife didn't try tricks, he wasn't going to go into prison. Had he not gone into prison, he wouldn't have been able to translate the dreams. Had he not translated those dreams, he wouldn't have ever been mentioned by the king when the king saw a dream. Had the king... Had he not translated the dream of the king, he probably would have remained in that prison for however long. And had that not happened, he probably would have never ever ended up the minister of Egypt. Now whose life is a mess? Anyone wants to see? Is your life a mess? It's how you look at it in most cases. It's what you make of it in most cases. In some cases, it's a test on top of a test. But I want to warn you, in some cases, yes, it is a mess. I want to tell you on a lighter note, talking about a mess. There was a couple who could not speak English. So they went on a honeymoon to an English speaking country. And as the, the husband, you know, the, the groom now, he, he's going into the bathroom and he hears his bride scream the other side. Ah! So he says, what happened? She says, there is a rat here, you know, like a mouse here, mouse. This man is, now this is like a mess because you're on a honeymoon. You, you paid a five-star package. You're finding a rat in your, in your honeymoon suite. Imagine, imagine if you were two and there was a third in the room. Huh? There's, there's a third in the room. So this man phones, who should I phone? Let me phone housekeeping, housekeeping. He rings the number, housekeeping. Now he's got a big mess. What's the big mess? I can't speak, what do I say? The poor fellow, the only thing he knew were cartoons. He says, housekeeping. Housekeeping says, yes. He says, housekeeping. He says, yes. He's thinking, he says, you know, you know Tom and Jerry? You know Tom and Jerry? So housekeeping says, yes. He says, Jerry is here. <laughs> Jerry is here. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. That is a mess. That's a big mess. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. He should have chosen a place to go where at least he can communicate with them. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. See, they warned me about Mauritius. Mashallah, I think I'm getting the fever also. <laughs> so, the problem is sometimes we're in a real mess because we did not do anything to learn the Arabic language. Now, that's a serious point. Make an effort because sometimes when the push comes to shove, people can fool you, people can con you. We need to know. I want to ask you a question that you can answer in your own hearts. How many years are you Muslim for? Most of us, I think we were born Muslims. Am I right? How many years have you been reading Salah for? I think the bulk of us, inshallah, we've been reading Salah for quite a number of years, if not as many as possible. How many years do you know Surah Al-Fatiha since? Okay, perhaps 20, 30, 40, depending on our age. Who can recite for me the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha just like that? Inshallah, there will be a number. There will be a number of us, I think, who can do that. But I want to take it one step further. The surahs that you have been reading in Salah all along that you know of by heart, how many of us have made an effort to try and understand what they mean? I think now the number becomes small. Am I right? So we laugh at someone who says Jerry is here, but we are saying Jerry is here every day because really we don't even know what's happening. We've got no clue. If we have to explain something, we can't do it. And that's our book. If I were to tell you, listen, brother, I will give you 50 million rupees if you study this language. Let me thumb suck. I give you a language, uh, Burmese. 50, who would learn it? I don't want you to put up your hands, but I think a lot of us would try. I think I would as well. To be honest with you, not a bad deal. We try our best. Wallahi, what we have, the happiness that you have, the deen that you have, the akhirah that you have, how much effort are we ready to make for that? It is worth much more than 50 million rupees. It's worth much more than anything we need in our lives here. The happiness of the akhirah, the happiness in the dunya. Allah did not promise you that you will have material items in this world, but He promises you contentment. 
And that brings me to another point. Some people think they're in a mess because they don't have money. To be honest with you, you need to budget. You need to adjust your life downwards. Some people, when their salaries go down, they don't want to adjust their lives downwards because they're too used to living to a high life. So what they do, they go to the bank and get a loan. That itself, you are asking for trouble. I don't want to tell you who you are like. I've already given you examples. But you are asking for trouble on your own. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. We need to be alert. We need to be awake. We need to be people who are vigilant in the sense that whatever there is in terms of goodness to achieve for Allah's sake, we must be there first. You know, for money, we can do anything. I told you moments ago, 50 million. What is 50 million? One man deposited. In fact, there was a man. Every time he passes the bank midnight, he hoots loudly because he sees the, he sees the guard at the door of the bank. He sees the guard at the door of the bank. The guard is sitting on his chair and like, you know, talking. So he's hooting loud when the guard wakes up and looks and the guy drives away. He did it one night, two nights, three nights, four nights, five nights. All he's, he keeps on doing this. So one day the guard says, I'm going to catch this man. So what he did, he got up as soon as the hooter was heard. He got up and he says, hey, what's your problem? And he stopped the vehicle and blocked it. So this man says, he opened the window. He says, why do you trouble me, disturb me every night? He says, hey, I have deposited my money in this bank. I don't want you to sleep. <laughs> Look at how concerned he is. Obviously, it's on a lighter note. But he's so concerned, he doesn't know how the banks work. And he thinks this little guard here is going to, either if he sleeps, the thieves might come and take my money tomorrow. It won't be my account. That's what he thought. So he goes up and wake him up. How many people are worried about the real essence, which is the deen and the akhirah and jannah. And we can't even wake up for salatul fajr, let alone hooting at a guard in the middle of the night. When your alarm wakes you up for Fajr, sometimes we set it for seven o'clock in the morning. We know Fajr is gone. So what's that? You are trying to make a cake with no sugar in it. That's what it is. And some of you might say, yeah, that's good. You know what? We make shitty, meaning a cake without sugar because of the diabetes. Some people say that. Yes. So let's take it further. How can you bake without flour and without the baking powder or the yeast, whatever you are using, depending on it? And without the eggs, if they are there, and so on. How can you do that? You wouldn't, isn't it? You would follow the ingredient. So why then don't we realize and understand? If I were to take, for example, an egg and put it into the ingredients of some recipe that has no eggs in it, I am asking for trouble. It's going to flop. So what am I doing in my life? Allah says, here's the ingredient for happiness. You won't be in a mess if you... Stay away from adultery, stay away from gambling, stay away from evil, stay away from falsehood and gossip. Watch your tongue. Stay away from wasting money. People are in a mess because of their tongues. A lot of mess is because of your tongue. You asked for it yourself. Its size is very small, but its crime is very big. A tongue that cut, it's deeper than the cut of a knife. Because the cut of the knife can heal. The cut of the tongue destroys even the best of relations. So be careful. We're in a mess. Why? Because we followed a path that was a different path from the path of success. We followed the path of the mess. So here we are. So the moral of it is don't. Don't follow the path of mess from day one. And if you are already in it, then your way out is repentance and tawbah and coming back to the path. That's the way. Keep your tongue constantly wet with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep your mind constantly fresh with the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your maker and you are answerable to him. That's what you need to know. Then what will happen? You won't be in a mess, inshallah. And make dua to Allah. Constantly ask Allah. There is a small group of people who might be in a mess because of other people. Sometimes you're in a mess because of someone else. Well, you need to pick up the pieces and carry on. Sometimes a person suffers a divorce. Sometimes a person suffers something due to someone else. They robbed you of your money. Now it's a mess. But remember, you need to get up, count your losses, proceed in the name of Allah, continue, try again. 
I always tell people, you know, when you write your examinations, I don't know in this country, do you have a British system perhaps where you write O-levels? So when you write your O-levels, what happens? You fail first time. What do you do? Give up? No. Write again. Sometimes if people get C or B, they want an A, they'll write again. You fail, you write again. You fail again, you write a third time. And after that, you pass. When you pass, you go to A level. You pass, you go to university. You come out a doctor. If you had given up the first time you failed, perhaps you'd have never gone anywhere. So don't give up. Keep on trying in the name of Allah. No matter what it is. I've given you an example of examinations. But in life, there are certain things. In business, you might fail once. You started your own business, it was a loss. Well, why did you lose? If you know why you lost, then close that door properly and try again. If you don't know why you lost, go and find a job and be employed by someone so that you don't lose. Some people are created to be employed by people and not to have their own businesses. Because sometimes you have a man who doesn't understand what is capital. If you don't know what's the capital in your business, you, you need to work for someone and get a salary, please. Because you will eat into your capital and before you know it, your business has flopped and you're in a big mess. But you didn't realize that it was your own doing that resulted in that particular mess. And this is why even in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he speaks about how important it is for us to concentrate on our own matters. Instead of leading ourselves to the path of destruction by worrying about other people in a negative way. You know, when you're worried about your brother who is poor, that's a good worry if you're going to give him wealth. But when you're worried about someone who is committing adultery, if you want to help him, it's a good concern. But if you want to spread his tail, it's a very bad concern. Leave it. It doesn't concern you. If you want to help him, you can guide him in a positive way. But if you want to backbite about him, forget. Min husni islam il mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'ni. One of the signs of a good Muslim is that he leaves that which does not concern him. Which means if you leave what does not concern you, you will be bothered about what concerns you. And in that particular case, will you lead yourself into the path of destruction and leading yourself into the path of a mess? The answer is no, because I'm worried about myself. So we need to constantly make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors at all times and love for your brethren what you love for yourself. If you don't like to people to spread rumor about you, be careful, don't spread rumor about someone else. Like we said moments ago, people don't realize the effect, the evil effect of their evil deeds. Sometimes we, when we engage in sin, then the barakah or the blessings from our sustenance is snatched away. Inna rajula la yuhramur rizqu bidhambi yusibuhu. A person, a man can lose some of his sustenance because of a sin that he is not leaving. And that is a common sense statement. Because say for example you have a mistress. So you have a wife, then you have a mistress. That is the ingredient of a mess. The explosion is coming. It's coming. The day you started it, there's going to be an ending. It's not going to last forever. No one's has lasted forever. Very few people have taken their mistresses to their graves. Very few. Very few. And even then, the mistress will come up and say, well, I was with your husband for 20 years. So instead of you saying, Ya Allah, forgive him, you say, Ya Allah, I thank you for taking him away. Big mess. Allah protect us. I hope there's nothing of that nature. Let me tell you. We start some haram relation. You know what it does to us? Wallahi, we pay for it. Wallahi, we pay for it. It has to have an effect. Because we're, we're choosing a path. If you have a path, the M1 from here to the airport, and somewhere you're now heading onto a side road, where are you going to go? Are you going to go to the airport? The answer is never. Because you chose another path. You chose another path which is leading in another direction. If you quickly come back, you cut your losses and you quickly return back to the path and you're going to back to the airport. If not, not only you missed your flight, but you don't even know where you're heading. So there is a path to happiness, a path to goodness and a path to paradise. When the minute you start a wrong relation somewhere, you have diverted. 
You will not come to that path unless you count your losses, seek forgiveness and get back onto it. Inshallah, leave whatever bad it was. If not, that costs more money than your legal wife. Remember that. Why? Your legal wife, mashallah, she cooks for you. She's at home and everything happens. You know, your children are there. There, you're paying rent. I want to stay in five star. I'm to stay in that area there. And where are you eating? Oh, I don't have time. Oh, we'll eat out. Don't worry. So what you spend for food one month in your proper home, that goes in one day here. And then what happens? Let me show you the effect of a mess. You come to your legitimate home where they haven't even spent your money much. They are so calm and relaxed. You get so angry for any small thing that happens in the house. Why? Because your money is going there. That's why. So from there, you say, hi darling, how are you? And when you come to your real wife, what happens? Why is this like this? You haven't yet done this. Why are the children not in bed? Why is this? Why? Because you can't do that that side. That's the reason. Do you know the joke? Some of you might have heard it. One of my talks where there was a man, so the soft natured man. You might have heard it. See, they are nodding. So inshallah, those nodding can tell those who are shaking their heads inshallah later on. They say this man was very soft natured. They told him if you're getting married to this woman, she's quite difficult. So rather, you know, you show her your authority the first day. You know, I was in Malaysia. Those of you who do know and someone emailed me to tell me one of the sisters actually emailed me to tell me you shouldn't have killed that cat. So let's not kill it today. Inshallah. So what happened? The brothers suggested to this man to say, you know what? With the first day you get married, you will go into the room. Your, your bride will be there. We will have a cat in the room. Now, no one likes a third party. I told you that. You, the bride and the groom, you don't want a third party there. So when the cat emerges from the bed, underneath the bed, you must get so angry. We will have a stick there. We start beating that cat. So, and after you get rid of that cat, your story will be over. The woman will understand this man is someone whom you don't mess with. You don't mess with. So now what happened? Everything worked per plan. Per plan, mashallah. The cat came out and the man got angry. Artificial anger, obviously. And he picked up the stick and he began to beat this cat and he let the cat out. Okay, we changed the rewire slightly. Can you hear that? So, and he let the cat out. So what happened? woman was frightened. Yo, this man, I heard he was soft natured. Look at this. Hey. So the man said, no, don't worry. It's okay. Every day in the morning, he says, hey, you have my tea ready or else. And he says, she says, no, 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 don't worry. I have it ready. And you do this, you wash my clothes by 12 o'clock or else. No, 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 no. I'll have it ready at 12 o'clock. Don't worry. It's there because she's worried. I know what happened to the cat. So she complained to her friends one day that you people told me this man was soft natured. He's one a very difficult man. He, he can beat the hell out of you. So the friend said, no, call his bluff. Call his bluff, meaning try him out one of the days. Defy. See, my sisters, I'm not calling on you to defy, please. So now this man says, you're going to have the tea ready by seven o'clock or else. So the woman says, or else what? Or else I'll have it ready. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. You see, this is, this is what we're talking about. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humility and humbleness. We lose our temper sometimes. Obviously, the moral is slightly different from the story. I just mentioned it because it came to my mind. But... We lose our temper sometimes with people we're not supposed to be losing it with because we have already bubbled the mess somewhere else. How many men are guilty of going to work and something happens there because you cannot vent your frustration with your boss, you come home and vent it on someone else who is innocent. If our children are paying for the frustration we have somewhere else, wallahi, we are creating two messes out of one. Because now your children's minds will be messed. And as they are growing up, they will be in a big mess. Dad is a person you can't talk to him. Dad is never here, number one. Number two is when he is, he's never happy. He's always in a bad mood. Why? You are creating a mess for your own children and your family. Sometimes parents come and say, you know, my son is on drugs. My daughter's on drugs. And I sit sometimes and I ask them, how 
often or how regularly do you have a meal with your child? Do you have a meal or two meals a day? How much time do you spend with your children? How many times have you embraced your own children? And how many times have you told them you love them? And how many times you have you told them you really, really miss them? And how many times have you bought them some gifts or surprises and just surprised them and given them something, even if it was light? And how many times have you made them feel like they are the most important people in this world? And a lot of the times, those whose children are astray are guilty of being busy doing something else not realizing it's about time you looked after your children now the mess who created it i wouldn't like to say we created it ourselves but i'm sure we are to blame as well may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our children from smoking to start with see i heard the amin before i said smoking once i said smoking where's the amin say it loudly amin why? Because, yes, there might be people who are smoking and so on. We all know that it's something bad, very bad. But at the same time, you don't want it for your children. Believe me. It's too bad to want it for your children. So if you are a role model for your own children, you are saving them from a mess. So when they say, when, when they grow older, they won't even need to say, help me out of my mess because you already helped them out of their mess before they were in the mess. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us out of our mess. Believe me, when you don't read salah, you pay for it. You pay for it. How? Something will happen. It has to happen. If you don't want to dress appropriately, don't think you can defy Rabbul Alameen. That is Rabbul Alameen. You know, the other day I was speaking about Surah Al-Rahman and a valid point came to my mind. All of us know one verse from Surah Al-Rahman off by heart. What is it? You said it. And a lot of us would know what it means. Which is it of the favors of your Lord? O mankind and jinn kind, do you deny? What's the answer? We don't deny anything, Ya Rabbi. But the answer is not good enough verbally. You need to display that answer in your actions. When you don't want to dress properly, you are saying, Ya Allah, you've given me this, you've given me that. Don't worry, I'm denying all of that. I can still dress how I want. Allah says, my worshiper, do you want to pay for it? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May Allah make us from those who can dress appropriately. It's not difficult. Believe me, there are new Muslims, reverts, who are, who are dressing properly against all odds. And we born Muslims, we don't want to dress properly. So Allah says in the Quran, if you want to turn away, we will replace you with others who won't be like you. They will do what we want them to do, not like you. So don't think you're doing Allah a favor. You're doing yourself a favor. Like I said, if you're not reading Salah, there are 10 other people who will start reading Salah because you've left it. Don't think Allah needs that from you. But the biggest problem is, then we cry when we are in a mess. Because we never ever turned to Allah. In another verse Allah says, Allah says, Man, when we give him goodness and we make his life easy, he turns away and lies on his side. He turns away from us sometimes. And when we inflict him with something, he makes a broad dua. You know what's a broad dua? A broad dua, some of you might have seen it in the masjid. You know, people make dua like this, right? Some people make like this. Have you seen it? Some people make like this. Have you seen it? Then you get the uncle saying, Ya Allah, hey, he's got a big problem. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allah grant us ease. No, it's not the size of the problem. Obviously, people think that when you've got a big problem, you, you know, you get more. No. That's, you, where, you, where your hands are doesn't mean broad or short. But 
people begin to cry but brother my sister did it need allah to inflict you with harm before you turned to him is that what was needed well if he loves you he'll do that for you i hope you understood the question let me ask it again in a different way are we going to wait for something bad to happen in our lives before we turn to Allah, start dressing properly, start reading our salah, start, we, we stop gossip and stop backbiting, or will we wait for the day when Allah gives us two smacks on our faces and then we're going to turn? What are we waiting for? Sometimes we are, our life is too easy, too easy, so we don't turn to Allah. That is the time you must turn to Allah. You know the hadith. The Prophet says, تعرف إلى الله في الرخاء يعرفك في الشدة. Get close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in times of ease, and He will get close to you in times of difficulty. Why do we have to wait for times to become difficult? Then we say, Ya Allah. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala grant us ease. But still, if difficulty has already come in our path, it's not too late. Turn to Allah. Be happy with the decree of Allah. Remember one golden rule. You will never ever have whatever you want in this life. Remember that. Life never ever goes as you plan it. It doesn't. Anta turidu, wallahu yuridu, wallahu yaf'alu ma yuridu. You want and Allah wants. And Allah does what he wants because what he wants overrides what you want. And all the time what Allah wants is better than what you want you think it's something minor but Allah has something better for you like I started I end and I want to bring back the example of the death sometimes you've lost a loved one and to you ya Allah why did you do this to me don't ever say that why bear sabr silently you can shed tears you make dua you ask Allah to grant them forgiveness. The biggest gift you can give a deceased person is the simplest, but people don't understand that. What is the biggest gift you can give someone who's passed away? To make dua for them. That's the biggest gift you can ever give them. And then imagine if you had to come on the day of Qiyamah and Allah says, my worshiper, for you is paradise only because we took your child away and you were patient. When we saw that patience, today we don't want to take reckoning of any other deeds, just enter paradise. Allahu Akbar. Wasn't that cheap? And when you enter paradise, who do you see? Your child is there. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So this is why, remember Allah's plan, we don't understand it because our brains are still so small. Allah says, وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You have not been granted knowledge except a little bit of it. A little droplet of it. We don't, we might have arrived at the moon. We might have technology that will take us to wherever we want. We might have Bluetooth and wireless. And very soon we might have yellow teeth and green teeth. One wonders. It will come. But still man doesn't understand the basics, the basics. He cannot see into the future, Allahu Akbar. And over and above that, man cannot even explain to you from a medical perspective what sleep and dreams are all about. A dream, tell a doctor to explain to you, he'll give you something, but it's not the deep explanation. Allah has left certain things beyond our understanding. I was reading an article last night in Johannesburg of how a certain professor, French professor, looked at the Pharaoh. You know the Pharaoh, the Firaun, who is preserved. They say it was Ramses II, Allah knows best. So he had seen how this defies everything scientific. How is this body not rotting? You see, Allah knows best. It went into the sea, isn't it? The Quran is the only scripture that says that the body came out 
and Allah will preserve it. Allah says in the Quran, فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً On this day, we shall take that body out and preserve it so that it can remain as an example for those who come after you. This means the Pharaoh. He used to say, I'm God. Today, look at him. Little mummy. I don't even know why they don't call them daddies. They call them mummies. When I first heard the word mummy and I was young, I was wondering, what will it be? Were these leaders all women? Mummy. Allahu Akbar. Anyway, those daddies. So, look at him. Helpless. Skin is still there. Some of it peeled off. But it's still there. But it's not rotting. Now, whether it is the salt content from the ocean or something else, Allah knows best. But people have accepted Islam by studying that preserved body and looking at what the Quran says. People have accepted Islam. We have the deen in front of us. Why do we find ourselves still finding it difficult to adopt one or two things there? For what? Come on, it's about time. You know, I always tell people, you really want to turn? What are you waiting for? Who do you want to come and talk to you? Say his name, I'll bring him. Who do you want to come and talk to you? If we bring him, will you turn? If the answer is yes, bring him. You can bring him. Or we'll fly you to him, wherever he is. Then will you turn? Wallahi, it's just a cheap excuse. Let me tell you. And I'll end with this, inshallah. You see why people are in a mess. People are in a mess when they are reminded constantly, but they still don't take heed. So you're reminded once, you see it, you, you, you don't want to come. You're reminded twice, you see it, you don't want to come. You're reminded thrice, you see it, you don't want to come. And so on. Then listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam. Nuh alayhi salam, the prophet Noah, may peace be upon him, called his people towards worshipping Allah for 950 years and he lived with them for even longer than that then there came a time when he saw that ya allah these people imagine in 950 years just a handful of them accepted just a handful accepted the message so what did he say rabbi la tadhar ala al ard min al kafirin dayyara allahu akbar oh allah destroy all of these people don't even leave one of them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded the call. So when you're in a big mess, ask yourself, have I ever harmed a friend of Allah? Have I ever spoken bad about some ulama who are working in the field? Have I ever engaged negatively in the life of someone innocent? If that's the case, maybe you're paying. Have I ever cheated people out of zakat? Have I ever miscalculated or not paid my zakat? If that's the case, maybe you're paying. You see, maybe you're paying. So when you, when you have a problem, people will come to you and say, brother, don't worry, bear sabr, bear sabr. You know, it's a means of elevation. Don't worry, it's a means of you going closer to Allah. Nobody will come and say, brother, you know what? Ask yourself, have you paid your zakat? Did you make enemies with these people who are serving Allah's cause? Have you sworn people behind their backs? What have you done? Tell us. Are you, not, are you committing adultery and you don't want to leave it? What's the story? Are you a person who goes to the clubs and casinos? Are you a person who engages in dr the drinking of alcohol? Are you a per Why? Because these things also, Allah gives us a good hiding, literally. He gives us a beating. Because sometimes we engage in this type of thing in order to get us out of it. Nobody's going to come and tell you that. Look at what happened to Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to his call in such a way that Allah says, look, the quota, I'm wording it in my own words, then I'll read the verse. The quota of the number of times that it was written for them to receive a warning is over. Now they will not turn. None of them will turn. So stop calling them. That's what Allah told Nuh alayhi salam. وَأُوحِيَ إِلَىٰ نُوحٍ أَنَّهُ لَنْ يُؤْمِنَ مِنْ قَوْمِكَ إِلَّا مَنْ قَدْ آمَنْ فَلَا تَبْتَئِسْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْعَلُونَ Allah says, we reveal to Nuh alayhi salam that now 
nobody knew is going to believe. Whoever believed, believed. Whoever disbelieved shall remain disbelievers. So stop calling them. Just leave them, ignore them, and forget about what they're doing. You start building your ark. Have you ever thought for a moment what that means? That is a very serious verse. It means Allah has written how many times you and I are going to be warned. After my quota is over and yours, it stops. It's not going to come after that. In my predestiny and yours, if it was written that you are going to get 3,578 messages, and after that you'll die either this way or that way. If you have turned within the 3,000 messages, you are lucky. If not, you are doomed. Do you see my point? So why I say this is, sometimes we love lectures. We love to listen to this person and that person. But what did you do about it? Did your life change? Well, if it didn't, we wasted our time and so did everybody else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from those who've wasted their time because the minimum inshallah is Allah will reward us. And I'd like to hope that everybody who is here, we are here with the, the softened part of our hearts to listen to a good word because we want to come out of our mess. The way to come out of your mess is before you die, turn to Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and grant us goodness. Inshallah, until we meet again tomorrow evening, we say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال الذين كفروا لا تسمعوا لهذا القرآن والغو فيه لعلكم تغلبون فَلَنُذِيقَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَسْوَأَ الَّذِي كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ ذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ أَعْدَاءِ اللَّهِ النَّارُ لَهُمْ فِيهَا دَارُ الْخُلْدِ جزاء بما كانوا بآياتنا يجحدون وقال الذين كفروا ربنا أرنا الذين أضلانا من الجن والإنس أرنا الذين أضلانا من الجن والإنس نجعلهما تحت أقدامنا نجعلهما تحت أقدامنا ليكونا من الأسفلين إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ نُزُلًا مِنْ غَفُورٍ رَّحِيمٍ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا 
صالحا وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عباده الذين اصطفى الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلقه أجمعين وبعد we commence as always by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for indeed he is the maker, the nourisher, the cherisher, the sustainer, the provider, the protector, the curer, the one who is in absolute control of every single aspect of every single creature's existence. We praise him. We praise him eternally and we send blessings and salutations upon the masterpiece Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace be upon him and his entire household and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings be upon all the companions and all those who have struggled and strived to convey the message to us to bring it to us in a way that mashallah it has got to us today may Allah make us from those who appreciate and may he make us from those who can learn may he make us from those who spend time and money effort and energy to learn what life is all about for indeed he has sent us that manual and may Allah make us from those who can put it into practice and convey it to others in a way that our children will also be on the straight path up to the end of time Amin. my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam it brings a smile to the face once again to see the beautiful faces here which are also full of smiles there we are mashallah this evening, inshallah, we will be speaking about the beauty of the Quran. What a subject. Where do we start and where do we end? I think there is no ending to this particular subject. All we can do is present a few words to encourage myself and yourselves to look into the beauty of this book, the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm sure most of us have heard those verses and we know them perhaps off by heart. Do you know what they mean? Had we sent this Quran down on a mount, we would have found it crumble into little pieces and we would have found it at the same time in the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being crushed in totality because the Quran is such a powerful book. But when it comes to man, not only do we take it for granted, but at the same time, we cover it from cover to cover every year but it still hasn't affected us sometimes why i say this is we are very close to the month of ramadan that was one of the reasons of the choice of this subject or topic very close to the month of ramadan which is also known as the month of the quran and what happens in that month most of us would at least listen to what we call an entire khatma from the beginning to the end of the quran we've heard it but sometimes our lives have not been changed. Whereas if you look at the beauty of the book, it changed the lives of the enemies of Islam when they looked at a single verse with the correct heart. Their lives were changed. Take a look at Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu without going into the details of the story. To mention just a few points, he came out in order to murder the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as he was walking out, I'm sure you would know he was diverted. Subsequently, he read a few verses from amongst the opening verses of Surah Taha. It changed his whole life from being known as the enemy of Islam. He was now known as Radiallahu Anhu. May Allah be pleased with him. Amazing. So imagine four to five verses, not more, changed a person who was the enemy of Islam. How many of us are enemies of Islam? by the will of Allah, not even a single one. So why is it that it doesn't move us? It doesn't change us. We don't leave our bad habits. Whereas the beauty of the book is such 
you look with sincerity into the verses, Wallahi, it will change your life. It is a book that will lead you from this world to the next. In a condition that you are pleased, you are happy, you are content. It has in it, and we all know from the beauty of it, authenticity that is unmatched. No book on the face of the earth has such authenticity as the Quran. Today, in this hall, if we were to close all the doors, and amongst us, those who have memorized it off by heart, if we were to come up with one person to write, we would perhaps come up with it in a very short space of time, back exactly as the original that is found outside the hall. Amazing. No other book of so many pages can that happen to. What beauties does the book have? Subhanallah. So much so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us that he will look after the book. Listen to what he says. We have revealed this book and we will ensure that we look after it. We will protect it. The other books, the previous scriptures have been lost. One of the reasons why they are lost is because man adjusted the word of God for him to understand it. So he lost the word with us. We adjust ourselves in order to understand the word of God. So we won't lose it by the will of Allah. This is why some people when they accept Islam or they don't know much about Islam, they ask a question. Why do I have to read Salah in Arabic? Why do I need to say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen? Why can't I say that in English? We will tell them because the English language is only the attempt of man to explain to you the word of Allah. But the Arabic is the word of Allah. This is why in most translations, you will find the Arabic on one side and the English on the other. It's more like saying, you know what? This is the word of Allah. This is just my attempt to explain to you what it is. I may or may not be accurate. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us accuracy. So this is why one of the means of protecting the book is your salah. Every one of us, we have contributed towards protecting the Quran. And that is part of your basic belief in Islam because you need to read Salah without knowing some portion of the Quran off by heart. Whether you understand it or not is a secondary issue. But to memorize it initially for purposes of prayer and Salah is incumbent upon every one of us. Without that, we cannot call ourselves Muslim. We need to know at least Surah Al-Fatiha and at least two other Surahs in order to continue with Salah. Amazing. Did you ever think about it that you are being used to protect the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What a miracle. What a beautiful book. Allahu Akbar. And this is why the hadith speaks about how on the day of Qiyamah, yuqalu li sahibi al-Qur'ani, iqra' wa artaqi wa rattil kama kunta turattilu fi dunya fa inna manzilaka inda akhiri ayatin taqra'uha. A person who has memorized the Qur'an, sahib al-Qur'an means a person of the Qur'an, will be told, read. Listen to what Allah says. How beautiful Allah says. Read. And continue going up as you read. This is reading off by heart. Continue going up as you read. The levels of paradise are different. And continue reading as you used to read in the world. Kama kunta turattilu fi dunya. So if you find someone who used to rush with the book, they won't be able to read in any other way but rushing. So that's why relax, take your time. When you go to the masjid in Ramadan, don't hunt for the minute minder. You know what's a minute minder? Your clock every minute goes deep. So you know that a minute is crossed. And you count the minutes. They say that masjid 20 minutes, it's over. This masjid 18 minutes, it's over. Well, if you want, there's another masjid 10 minutes, it's over. Allahu Akbar. If that's what we're looking for, we've lost the whole essence of it. Take your time. Wherever there is correct recitation, go there. That is the beauty of the book. Because the book has an impact even on non-Muslims. When you recite the verses of the Quran, our hairs will stand. Wallahi. Because it is the word of Allah. Allah says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyaddabbaru ayatih. It is a book 
that we have revealed in order that its verses may be pondered over. How many of us ponder over the book? When Allah says, I revealed it so that you can ponder over its verses. We die without having pondered over the verses of the Quran. We've lost the plot. Why? Because someone somewhere told us, you know what? Don't read the tafsir of the Quran. A'udhu billah. May Allah safeguard us. When Allah says, we have sent the book down, ayatihi. The reason why we sent it down was for you to ponder deeply in its verses, O oh man. But man has read in it Blighton books. He's read Harry Potter. He's read Mary Poppins. He's read everything else. Come Quran, have you read it? You say, no uncle, not yet. Okay, not yet. So we hope when you've graduated from varsity. So pick them up. Have you read it? They say, no, we were busy with our accountancy books. Okay, you haven't read it. And then what happens? Now they are 60 years old. Have you read it? No, we had the tax department on our back. So we needed to know the laws of tax. So they were bigger books than the Quran. Allahu Akbar. Look how guilty we are. When Allah says the beauty of it, even the non-Muslims, even the jinn kind, when they heard its verses, what does, what does Allah say? قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا Allahu Akbar Allah says, say to them, it has been revealed to me that a group from amongst the jinn kind have heard the recitation of the book and as soon as they heard it they said oh we have heard this beautiful amazing recitation ajeeb meaning something amazing even the jinn kind recognized it and even the kuffar of makkah who did not accept the message they recognized it they understood it this is why if you look at the messengers who were sent from Quraysh. When I say messengers, I'm talking of the non-Muslims who were sent to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell him that what is this all about? Do you want wealth? We make you rich. You want women? Is that why you want all this popularity? We can get you married to the most beautiful. You choose, we give you. You want power? We make you our leader. What do you want? But leave leave calling towards one Allah forget about that speech we want to worship all our idols Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him are you finished you told me what you wanted to say he says yes so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says wallahi if you were to put the, the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left and ask me to abandon this I would not do that which means it's nothing material it is something for the pleasure of my maker Allahu Akbar and he started reading the opening verses of Surah Hamim Fussilat. We, we call it Hamim as Sajdah as well. Hamim Tanzilum Min Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Kitabun Fussilat Ayatuhu Quran and Arabian Likomi Alamun Bashiran wa Nadira. And he continued these verses until he got to a place when his mouth was closed and he was told stop it's enough because they knew that this is the truth. Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from such attitude. They closed his mouth when? When he said فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا فَقُلْ أَنْذَرْتُكُمْ صَاعِقَةً مِثْلَ صَاعِقَةِ عَادٍ وَثَمُودٍ If they turn away, warn them of a similar punishment of that which inflicted or affected Ad and Thamud. Warn them of the similar punishment. Immediately his mouth was closed. We don't want to hear what that punishment was. Look at the book. Allahu Akbar. The man goes back to Quraysh and says, Wallahi, I have heard a book. It is neither poetry, nor is it singing, nor is it ordinary speech. It is something between there. It, it has a sweetness and it is so eloquent and it is full of meaning and a human being cannot come up with it. Imagine, an enemy of Islam is bearing witness. Look at the beauty of the book. Subhanallah. We are the ummah of the book, but we still have not read it. We have not yet gone through its meaning. 
We don't know its message. We are the ummah of the book. You know, when people revert to Islam later on in life, you have a Christian. Later on in life, he reverts to Islam or she reverts to Islam. May Allah guide us all and guide them as well. You find they are more likely to have covered the entire Quran in meaning than the born Muslims. They are more likely. They will understand it better because they have been through the darkness. When they have seen the light for one moment, they realize this is light. It's a torch. I better make use of it very quickly because that's the whole purpose why I turned. Allahu Akbar. We live in ignorance. We engage in behavior that is unbefitting and unbecoming of a Muslim solely because we don't know the message of our own maker. So the people of Quraysh tell him, they say, oh, you want to turn your religion? How can you start praising this book? We only sent you to Muhammad, may peace be upon him, so that you can go and tell him, you know, make him some offer. And you coming back trying to tell us that the book is so great. He says, no, 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 no. I was just making mention of something. I don't have the intention of turning. Allahu Akbar. What about us? Sometimes we have the same answer. Sometimes we have the same answer. We know the message sometimes, but we are not keen. And sometimes we know how to hear and how to listen to the message. MashaAllah, today we have a full audience by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to make the same effort whenever the call is made to come and learn the deen. We need to make a similar effort. You don't need to wait for someone to come from abroad before you make an effort to come and learn. No. You have so many in your midst, scholars, people who are prepared to teach so many different courses. Which course are you engaged in? What have you done to try and understand the Quran? Everyone should be having a good answer because Allah will ask you and Allah will ask myself as well. The Quran has turned the lives of so many and it keeps on turning the lives of so many. Are we from amongst that number? May Allah make us from them. And this is why when the recitation of the Quran was played, just the recitation of the Quran was played to a group of people who were non-Muslim. It soothed them before they even knew this is the Quran that the Muslims are actually following. It soothed them. Once I was driving, you, some of you might have heard this before. I was driving and I stopped at a traffic light and my windows were wound down. And mashallah, the Quran was playing a little bit of a volume. And someone next door to me who had also stopped their vehicle at the traffic light, they commented, sorry, excuse me, excuse me. I said, yes, I love your music. I love your music. Wallahi, that day I wanted to weep. Because a little bit later through the day, there was a Muslim youngster who out of defiance, having seen other Muslims, having seen us basically, he turned on his music so loud in order to defy, to say, what are you going to do? I'll blast it. And the non-Muslim is telling me, your Quran sounds so beautiful. Look at this. How can we be from amongst those who go down in history? as having substituted the Quran with Britney Spears. It's a fact. How can we go down in history as people who substituted the Quran for Madonna and Michael Jackson? How? Do you know how beautiful the book is? If you are a person who is soothed by a calm recitation, there is a calm recitation you will find. That's Allah's power. The Quran is not just read in one tune, so many tunes. So you have a smooth flowing tune. Then you can have a slightly heavier tune. Then you have a loud one. Then you have a lower, slower one. And whatever soothes your ear, you find it on your phone now if you Google it. Allahu Akbar. We're ready to download the latest of music that we get. Are we ready to download the Quran and listen to it and eradicate the beat for the beat of Allah? Allahu Akbar. People say, no, there's a big debate about music. You know, whether it's allowed or not. I want to tell you, music controls you. It makes you move. It actually has a beat to it. That was nowhere near what happened at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, even amongst the kuffar. The way it is done today, it is done so professionally to 
to really make your mind high. You will be on a drug without even being on it. Allahu Akbar. You become high. You become so aroused. You become on a different level. You feel like committing sin. Now you want to debate with me that that thing is okay. A'udhu Billah. I always tell people to know that music is wrong. You don't need the Quran and the Sunnah as proof. You can even put those aside for one minute. Study the lives of the pop stars. I said it few weeks ago. What are they called? What did I say moments ago? Pop stars. Why? Each one of them pops one after the other pop. Then the next one you hear pop. The next one you hear pop. They all gone. Allahu Akbar. And they lead some of the most difficult lives, most depressing lives. The bulk of them are on antidepressants. Whereas all those who are reciters of the Quran, they are far from depression. Look at the beauty of the book. Have we not seen the light yet? You will not get peace through music. You will get it through the Quran. Because the one who is singing has had three divorces and perhaps they've almost committed suicide five times in their lives, but they're still singing and we're still blasting their beat in our cars. And whereas Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْذِرِينَ Jibreel alayhi salatu wassalam, the honest, the trustworthy, came down with the book into the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam so that he become from amongst those who warn. Allahu Akbar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings. Really, I challenge you to replace those CDs of beaten music with the CDs of the Quran. Find who you would like. Find the reciters. You know the reciters of today. MashaAllah. We have so many. Look for them. Hunt for them. See. There are websites that have gathered more than a hundred reciters just for you to choose from. And we have the book. The book that Allah says, Oh my beloved mankind, I have sent you a book that has in it the cure for your sickness, your illness, your ailment. Ya nasu qad rabbikum Oh people, a book that has a warning in it has been sent to you from your Rabb, from your maker that has in it the cure of the diseases that you are suffering, the diseases of the heart and it has in it guidance. And it has in it mercy for those who believe. I need mercy desperately in my life and so do you. We are leading lives of misery. The verses of the Quran have cure in them. Sometimes, you know, when a person goes to a sheikh and says, you know, I have this sickness. I need something to read. I need something to read. And the sheikh will give them something to read. I have a different way of looking at things. I will say, look, my brother, look, my sister, do you believe you might have a sickness that no one has discovered yet? You might have a sickness that no one knows. You don't know. Medicine has not yet found out. When it grows to a certain level, you might feel a little bit lethargic and you might go for the test. And thereafter, they may or may not discover it. So if that is the case, you need to know the Quran has in it cure. If you were to read it from the beginning in order every day, a portion, it is more powerful than anything else you could do. Because which verses have the cure for which diseases only Allah knows and which diseases you have only Allah knows. But in the whole, the Quran has in it cure for you as a whole. Allahu Akbar. So this is why it's important for us to read the Quran every day. Before we leave the home, you must have read at least one verse. This is why the, the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, and it's a common hadith that is repeated so much. Al-Quran hujjatul laka aw alayk. In another narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inna Allah la yarfa'u bihada al-kitabi aqwaman wa yada'u bihi akhareen. The Quran will either be 
witnessing for you or against you on the day of Qiyamah? Will the Quran say, this person read me, this person tried to understand, this person made an effort? Is that what the Quran will say? This person adopted the rules or will the Quran come and say, I was only on the shelf. And you know, when I was young, we used to hear the word bookkeeper. The uncle used to come home and you find my father asks him, what are you doing? A young boy, we used to hear him saying, I'm a bookkeeper. And I used to think really, what an easy job. It's just a shelf of books and you just polish them every day and dust them. You're keeping books. That's all you're doing. And as we grew up, we realized, no, it's much more than that. We are bookkeepers in that childish sense when it comes to the Quran. We keep it very nice. We want to put it high. You should be putting it high. That's the, no doubt. We want to keep it proper. We cover it, but that's it. It must not collect dust. We wipe it every day, but it has collected spiritual dust and rust and spiritually it's not even there. We use it literally for show beautiful verses in our homes. You have the names of Allah. We've never used them to call out to Allah, but they are in our dining room. Go and check back at home. Names of Allah. We have verses of the Quran that have been in our house for 20 years. We haven't memorized them, but every day we walked in, walked out. We looked at it. Wow. Allahu Akbar. That's all it was there for. MashaAllah. You walk into a, a beautiful Islamic art, you know, place and you see, oh, beautiful verse. Look at how it's written. Phew, it looks like a ship. Let's take it home. We take it home. The ship was in the house for so long. It was a spiritual Titanic. It's sunk. It will bear witness against you on the day of Qiyamah. Some people are frightened to hang up verses because they say, hey, that's a verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With us, we need to know, don't ever let that Quran be in your house without you having opened its pages, read the Arabic, try and read the French of it or the English of it, your language of it. Try and understand. You don't understand something, go and ask the ulama, they are there. Don't jump into your own conclusions. That's the only time you go wrong. The only time you go wrong is when you jump into your own conclusion. So you find a man, he reads a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about alcohol at a certain stage. You find that in Surah Baqarah. Allah says, they will ask you about alcohol and gambling and so on. Tell them in it, there is some good and some bad. There is good and bad, but the bad outweighs the good. So now you find a wise crack. What does he say? Oh, there's some good. The Quran says there's some good in alcohol. So now we can drink moderately. Moderately drinking is not a problem. And the other uncle will tell you, I can sell in my shop because there are a lot of people. And someone will say, you know, I have a restaurant. And in my restaurant, you know, if you don't put alcohol, nobody's going to come. So I just put a little bit because Quran says it. Here's the verse. Who, which uh, sheikh is going to debate with me today? That means we don't understand the basics of Islam. If that is the case, go out and ask a question. Look, we were taught it's haram. So what is this verse all about? And you will be explained too that you know what? This was just a stage at the beginning of the prohibition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assisted the people to begin to hate alcohol before it was finally made prohibited so that at least their hearts would be divorced from it and they would not even want to go back to it. This is why it is reported that some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the minute they heard this verse, they left everything they knew that if there's more bad than good, obviously it's something that we shouldn't be doing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So this is the book, the beauty of the book, as we are saying, you know, when we talk of beauty, we're talking of the beauty of the message, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I like to give an example. If you have a news bulletin and your president has spoken, what will happen? Those words will be relayed very accurately to the rest of the masses because any blunder you make, there is a problem. So you find they will choose the best news reader in order to relay the message in the clearest term. They will repeat it many times, morning, afternoon, evening, because it's a message from the president. And it's something very important. What about the message from your Rabb, the maker of you and the president? 
then we need to read that message as well in an eloquent manner understand it you don't understand the tax law you begin to ask the accountant but you don't understand how the tax law of the hereafter works you don't even ask anyone in fact we die without knowing it's also a tax law we will pay for everything we did a percentage Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar we pay for it later on I know Mauritius mashallah has some beautiful laws in terms of tax let's hope that even religiously we also understand that we have the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to abide by which is even more beautiful so this is the Quran and then Allah has granted it extra beauty what's the beauty in order to ensure that we are left with no excuse Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith where he explains the rewards of reading a single letter a single letter I'm sure we know it don't we how many rewards do we receive for reading one letter can anyone tell me 10 not just one and the hadith says Alif Lam Mim is not a letter but Alif is a letter Lam is a letter Mim is a letter imagine Allahu Akbar if I were to say how many rewards is that you can't count you can't count it's like the price of fuel petrol when it goes up and you see how it clicks similar to that mashallah that one we get irritated with it why do we get irritated with the recitation of the Quran as well why as I said before leaving the home it would be wrong for us to depart without having read one verse and then make it two and ponder over it throughout the day wallahi it will change your life you become a better person there is a barakah and this brings me back to Abu Hassan and Nadawi rahmatullahi alayhi Allah grant him Jannah once he was sitting with some people and they brought a youngster and they said, you know what? Hada yahfad al Quran. Listen to the wording. The word yahfad means to protect and also means to memorize. So they pointed at the young boy and they said, This man has or this boy has memorized the Quran. It also means this boy has protected the Quran. The same wording in the Arabic language. So he looked at them and he said, Balil Quran yahfadu. Allahu Akbar. He said, no, the Quran is protecting him. It is the Quran that's looking after him. Why? Because, and he continues to explain, Allah says, We have sent down the Quran, we will look after it. So if you have made it your business to put it in your heart, Allah will look after you because you have the Quran in you. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Amazing. So look at how beautiful it is. Who is ready to make an effort to memorize the Quran? Remember one thing. Even if you memorize one verse a day, one verse, half a verse a day, if your intention is, Ya Allah, one day I will finish. Even if you don't finish before you die, we have a beautiful teaching. All actions are judged by their underlying intentions. And for every person, shall be the reward equivalent to their intention or according to their intention so in islam if you have intended something seriously and for some reason you did not manage to execute it you still get a full reward for it did you know that that's islam that's allah so what's the harm in making a good intention now firm that ya allah i want to memorize one verse a week allahu akbar look we're making it cheaper it sounds like an auction here doesn't it Allahu Akbar, we're making it cheaper. That's the beauty. Even if it's one verse a week, some of us have not done it. Subhana Rabbi Al A'la. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us there is cure in the book. And He told us you will achieve paradise through the book. And He says, This is my book. I have sent down. It's the word of Allah. Kalamullah. It means the speech of Allah more important than anything I have ever come across and then Allah gives us a whole month the month of Ramadan the month of the Quran 
wherein the recitation of the Quran, the reward of it is multiplied just like all other good deeds are multiplied in terms of reward in the month of Ramadan. What a beautiful month. What a gift of Allah. Do you know that the Muslims are the only ones whom on mass, which means all of them, they cover the Quran. They complete the Quran in recitation from one side right to the other. The other religions do not do it that way. If you look at a Bible, pick up any Bible, you will find in most cases at the beginning, especially the newly printed ones, they will tell you recommended readings. You have a headache, go to that verse and read this. You've got a family problem, go to this verse and read that. You are feeling this way, that way, go to that verse and read this. So a Christian by default, perhaps probably including priests and some bishops and so on, they have not really covered the Bible from cover to cover as we as the Muslims do on an annual basis. They don't. It's not part of the requirements of their church. But they will all move with the Bible every Sunday. Have you noticed that? Have you seen it here in your country? Sunday morning, even a person who cannot read, he's got the Bible and he's moving with it. Allahu Akbar. And he's going to the church. We see it in our countries, full. And everyone has a Bible. Because they know we're going, we're going to be told open here, let's read. Now close, now let's sing. Now let's do this and do that. Allahu Akbar. We have not reduced our religion to a mere show. We need to be practical. We need to practice upon the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is undisputed. It has in it miraculous wordings. Did you know that if there is a dispute in Arabic language grammar, it goes back to the Quran. Did you know that? Which means they will look into the Quran in order to solve the crisis. Amazing. So Arabic grammar agrees that the highest of its form is found in the Quran. Allahu Akbar. And here we are, we know it off by heart. We know it off by heart. The Quran has come with some amazing verses, some deep meanings. And yet we sit here saying, MashaAllah, the Quran, that's the Quran. What have we done about it? That's the question. What did we do? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. Really? We are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here we have the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to read the Quran and it used to be revealed on a regular basis, they used to memorize it. They used to memorize it. Remember at that time, what was the latest? You know, today if I tell you what's the latest technology, you tell me a smartphone. Phones are smart, mashallah, they, don't, they look quite smart as well. You tell me, oh, we have Wi-Fi today. We spoke about it yesterday, the Bluetooth and so on. You tell me, we have uh, this vehicle of this nature and so on. We have computers with terabytes, no longer gigabytes. It goes beyond that. It goes, it's far big, the brain. And you will probably say, you see this room here we have? If you fill this room with books a thousand times, you'd probably get so many meg. And we've got a thousand meg, which makes a gig and a thousand of that, which makes a terabyte. They call it TB. If you've seen it, not the disease, tuberculosis, but TB. MashaAllah, that's great. At that time, what was the technology? Let me tell you, they had brains better than our computers. They knew the lineage of camels 10 generations back. So they did not use to read and write, but that doesn't make them uneducated. That's the difference. With us today, someone doesn't know how to read and write, you say, uncle is uneducated, sit with him. If he's an elderly man, you might get wisdom that you've never found in any books. It's possible. At that time, perhaps they were from amongst those who were extremely eloquent, but it was not the in thing to write. Very few people knew how to read and write. Because Allah says in the Quran, It is Allah who sent amongst the unlettered a Nabi for them. From them, he sent to them. So from amongst the unlettered, he sent one from them. Allahu Akbar.
which means most of them were unlettered. So today people have started a new debate. What's the debate? Well, when was this Quran compiled? When was it brought together? Why did it take them so long? The Hadith, it's not valid because it was only written so many hundred years after the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For your information, that is such a foolish statement. So foolish. It's like asking a question today that why didn't Jibreel alayhi salam come with a flash stick and give them? Why? Same question. It was not the in thing. It wasn't there. People didn't use flash sticks. If Jibreel alayhi salam had to come today, only Allah knows how he would have come. But obviously, wahi is over. Nubuwa is over. So he's not going to come. But when he came, he gave something more powerful than a flash stick. Allah says, he brought it down to your heart. I already read that verse. Ala qalbika. Into your heart, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why when we've memorized something, what do we say? He knows it off by heart. He knows it off by heart. Allahu Akbar. So that question is irrelevant. They, they started jotting it down when people's memories, as the generations came, began to depend more on writing. Us seated here, we are not very far off from the time when there were no mobile phones. I knew perhaps hundreds of telephone numbers off by heart. I knew them. Today, I don't even know 20. Why? Because of technology. Technology made me lazy. You have a contacts book. How many of you have lost your contacts? And then you say, oh, I should have backed it up, back up. Every day when you're fiddling with the phone, it says back up. And you say, no. One day you lost your phone, you say, I should have backed it up. Allahu Akbar. Ma, I always say, perhaps you were in touch with someone detrimental for your deen and your dunya. So Allah made all your contacts disappear so that you don't contact them again. But you didn't get the message. Can happen. Gift of Allah sometimes. Perhaps. Anyway, get back to the book. At that time, when people started writing, the first thing that was written was the Quran. And the first thing that was written thereafter or the next was the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how dare we come and say these ahadith were only jotted down so many years later. Go back and think of that statement. It's not valid. You cannot start saying that it's wrong. The hadith is wrong because of when they jotted it down. No. Allahu Akbar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors, grant us goodness. What beats me is when a person is debating, debating, but they're not even prepared to read the Quran. They're not even prepared to understand the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is in the Quran? Good question. What is in it? So the hadith explains what is in the Quran. In the Quran, we have news of those who passed. That means history. There is history of the previous nations. Those verses, every single one of us will understand. But not every single one of us will be able to extract relevant lessons from those stories. You need someone to show you how to do it. We read the story of Noah, Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, may peace be upon him. We read the story of the prophet Abraham, may peace be upon him. We read all sorts of different stories of different prophets and we get happy. Oh, that prophet was powerful. Sulaiman alayhi salam. Oh, he was powerful. He could speak to the birds. He could speak to the jinn. And you know what? He could command and instruct the wind and the clouds and they would move according to his instruction. Wow. And we stop there. But we don't understand. Allah has given myself and yourselves also certain powers. Don't you have ears you can hear me with right now? Well, the message you've heard, what are you going to do about it? Sulaiman alayhi salam appreciated the gifts of Allah by utilizing them in his obedience. Do we appreciate the gifts of Allah by utilizing them in his obedience? How many of us have used our eyes to watch pornography? A'udhu billah. And then we want the mercy of Allah. Then we want to achieve blessings and beauty by reading the Quran thereafter. We need to engage in tawbah. We need to ask Allah to forgive us. I've always said that we are living in an age of pornography and an age of hypersexual activity and perversion. That is the age we're living in. To the degree that people don't realize when you see something immoral, 
it has a deep-rooted effect throughout your veins. The first time, you might feel different. The second time, it reduces your level. And thereafter, it makes you a person who has no respect for the opposite sex. And it reduces you to a person whose spirituality levels have dwindled. But there is a way out. I don't even want to go further as to what it does. There is a way out. What is that way? Ask Allah's forgiveness and never go back on that path. If I were to tell you that, Wallahi, there's a lion right outside there roaring. Sorry, brother, not you. Behind there, the door. So if I were to tell you that there is a lion out there roaring, the door would be closed. We'd all be running out that side there. Which fool would want to open that door and say, no, let me go. I try. Allahu Akbar. When we are told by Allah not to engage in certain activity, it's worse than a lion. But we're ready to go there and say, no, don't worry, not me. Me, it won't affect. Wallahi, it will sweep you and swallow you up. Allahu Akbar. And this is why Allah is so forgiving. The same Quran has a balance. It has a warning and it has good news. Wherever in the Quran there is mention of the punishment, either before it or after it, or before it and after it, there is mention of the mercy of your maker. And for this reason, Allah starts the opening chapter of the Quran by Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Allahu Akbar Most forgiving, most merciful. Because imagine if the opening verses were severe in punishment. Severe in punishment. Every time you hear Allah's name, you are saying, you are thinking to yourself, severe in punishment, severe in punishment. We would not even feel like, you know, breathing because we'd be so worried. Allah is merciful. My beloved mothers and sisters, my beloved brothers and fathers who are here this evening, remember, Allah is most merciful. And Allah loves you to the degree that Wallahi, He is prepared to forgive you completely for anything you've done. One condition. Ask for that forgiveness and repent. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ The instruction to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, go out and tell my worshippers, those who have transgressed against themselves, tell them, Never ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Never lose hope in His mercy. For indeed, He, Allah, will forgive all your sins. Indeed, He is most forgiving, most merciful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness. So don't lose hope. That's the Quran and that's the message of the Quran. So the Quran has in it stories of the past. And Allah says thereafter, that these stories are not just tales that you must get excited about. No, there are lessons in these stories for you, O oh man. In Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى Indeed, in all these stories of the previous messengers, there are lessons for those who have intellect. Allahu Akbar. These are not just fabricated tales, Allah says. So that is one chunk of the Quran. The bulk of it has stories of the previous messengers. Do you know one of the reasons? One of the reasons is to show us their messengers came with the messages. Those who followed were successful and those who d denied and belied failed and they were finally and ultimately punished and destroyed. Every single messenger that happened to their people. So Allah is warning us, telling us, you also have had a messenger who came to you and you've also been sent a message and from amongst you there will be those who will deny and those who will not deny, they will accept. And you will fall into those categories. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not from those who reject. Listen to the verses I started with this evening. Allah says, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا تَسْمَعُوا لِهَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَالْغَوْفِيهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَغْلِبُونَ The kuffar, the disbelievers of, of the time, they had noticed and witnessed 
that people who are listening to this Quran are immediately turning to it. People who are listening to the Quran are turning to it. I have had so many people who have told me that we turn to Islam solely because we read the meaning of the Quran. And I think to myself, but there are so many Muslims who haven't yet read the meaning of the Quran. Allahu Akbar. So the kuffar used to say, do not listen to this Quran. Make a noise when it is being recited so that you can be from amongst those who are victorious above. That is why for us it's prohibited to make noise when the Quran is being recited. Because then we join the ranks of those who used to make noise. Allah says, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنصِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ When the Quran is being recited, if you want mercy upon you, keep quiet and listen attentively. Try and understand the message. Mercy, inshallah, will come upon you. The kuffar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with them in a different way. Some of you might know there is a difference between the verses revealed in Mecca and the verses revealed in Medina. Very big difference. Difference in subject matter, different in, difference in length of the verses, and difference in so many other things. Allahu Akbar. If you look at the opening of the surahs, in some of the surahs you find hurufun muqatta'ah, which means separated letters. I'm sure you've heard them, where you hear, for example, Taasim. What does that mean? I don't know. You don't know. No one knows. Allah knows. So, why was such a verse revealed? Well, Allah knows best. It might have a meaning, but Allah knows it. But what we do know, what happened at the time of Quraysh was. The Prophet ﷺ was known as a very eloquent person and he used to read the Quran. They did not want to listen. So when they heard Taasim, they were shocked. What? Imagine someone tells you there's a good speaker here. And I see the brothers are laughing. Someone tells you there's a good speaker here and you come to listen to him or you don't even want to listen to him. And one day you listen to a little disc. And he's saying, B, C, A, Y. What will happen? Exactly. You're all laughing. Because it doesn't make sense. This man is so eloquent. What are these letters? They're separated letters. And what do they mean? I don't know. You don't know. So it drew their attention to the Quran. They were interested in the message thereafter. So this is just one of the fruits of those type of verses. But we don't know what it means. Allah knows why they are there. One day we will find out. Those are the only verses where we say, Allah knows the meaning of it in his knowledge. Then the verses in Makkah were very short. That's the beauty of the Quran. So short. Listen. Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum fa'anvir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, wa thiyabaka fa'tahir. If you want, you can even see إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ Allahu Akbar. Short verses. One of the reasons was that verse where the kuffar of Mecca used to tell each other, put your fingers into your ears when the Quran is being read because if you don't, it is like going to bewitch you it will bewitch you so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam starts reading or anyone reads a verse say for example or let, let's read something else Allahu Akbar. they take their fingers they put them into the ears and now it takes a minute it takes a moment to put the fingers up so as they're taking their fingers the verse is over when they put it Inside, they're thinking, oh, the verse is over. They're now pondering. And when they think now the message is finished, they put their fingers down. Oh, now they're thinking again. What does that mean? Wow, it's powerful. Then they put the fingers thinking now it's over. 
وألقت ما فيها وتخلت and so on and the message would they would actually get an opportunity to ponder over the message and the messages in Mecca were all to do with belief in the last day belief in Allah the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the fact that there is a life after death the fact that there is answerability the fact that all these creatures are going to come to an end read those verses they are found towards the end of the Quran then in Medina Munawwara when everyone was now Muslim they were looking forward to the message they had long verses mashallah so you find the surahs all had long verses and for your information you see these surahs that have the beginning with the separated letters all of them were revealed in Mecca besides the first two all of them were revealed in Mecca besides the first two so the minute someone says Hamim you can say you know what that was revealed in Mecca and you'd probably be right in fact you would be besides the first two amazing that's the beauty of the Quran because it came in order to address the people in a manner that was palatable to the people they took it they digested it they understood it they reverted and converted Allahu Akbar look at the enemies of Islam people who committed murder prior to Islam they were humbled by the Quran it moved them do you know Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually made a statement ma mithlu khalidin yajhalul islama a man as intelligent as Khalid ibn al-Walid cannot be ignorant of the fact that Islam is correct that today on the globe has exactly the same meaning those who have sound intellect cannot be ignorant of the fact that Islam is correct if they have studied the Quran and the Sunnah sometimes what makes people divert or turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their greed for wealth or for power or status or fear of family fear of someone else fear of losing their circle what will happen so that is why they say I'm too powerful to turn to Islam that's what happens but in essence deep down they know this is a religion and they know that whatever people are saying to try and tarnish its image is propaganda in most cases may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from being tarnished the second type of verses in the Quran Allah says in the Quran he has revealed so many verses that have in them prophecies of what is to come in the future so there is there is news of that which was in the past and there is naba there is information and prophecy of what is to come in the future so Allah tells you of the life after death he tells you of the last day he tells you of so many things that are going to come in order for you to understand why you are here today if someone could come to you and tell you brother you are dying at the age of 63 years and 24 days what would you do I don't even know one day we were sitting and I told people you know the number of breaths you take is written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if your breaths that you take if yours are two million three hundred and fifty thousand four hundred or should I say four hundred and fifty for example then when you get to 49 that's the last one one left so some young boy started breathing slowly I said what are you guys doing he says, well, if we breathe a bit longer, you know, take it. We might live for a few more years because you said our breath is written. How foolish is that? But people think that way because we, we love life. But Allah is telling you, oh man, let's go beyond life. Can I give you an example? You see when you're sleeping, what happens when you're sleeping? Say there are two people sleeping next to each other, husband and wife. And husband is dreaming of, okay, let me word it the other way wife is dreaming of paradise mashallah and she's so happy and you know it's cool and relaxing and she's really somewhere very nice and poor husband is having such a nightmare you know the snakes are after him and you know people are behind him and there's people trying to shoot him and he's busy running and sweating and he's screaming and yelling and then they actually shoot him dead when you're shot dead in your dream what happens you wake up everybody oh it's happened to everyone mashallah you wake up 
and you realize that you know what Whew, that was just a dream Whoa, I was lucky and poor wife you're trying to get her up she says hey hang on I'm in paradise now it reminds me of a man he was being paid he was being paid by someone in his dream so he was debating he says I need 2,000 let's say rupees because in Mauritius I think you use rupees 2,000 rupees the man says no I give you 1.5 he says no 2,000 he says no I give you 1.5 he says no, I want 2,000 and in the interim his eye open he says oh no then he closes like okay give me the 1.5 <laughs> doesn't work like that Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar the moral of the story is that when you are sleeping and something bad happens to you you wake up into reality don't you and you realize all that was fake am I right fake in the sense that in your dream it was so real so believe me my brothers and sisters when you die it is quite similar I'd like to think to be waking up into reality and you realize that life was just temporary now is the real thing Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar why do we say this because Allah says in the Quran that life after death shall be eternal so this life Allah says indeed the life in this world is just amusement and a play a pastime in another verse Allah says indeed the life in this world is nothing but the provisions that are deceitful full of deception for those who are deceived by it so to be honest I will wake up one day to reality people will think I'm dead but I've basically woken up from my slumber may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make death easy upon us we all fear it because we haven't yet seen what comes beyond the description of Jannah in the Quran is so vivid the description of Jahannam in the Quran is so vivid what it is there, what is it there for it is there in order for us to be assisted and aided to prepare for the day we are going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is why you have verses I always tell people what do you love in this world if I were to say you can have what you want what are you going to say I think people will say depending on their age you know a young person might say I need a PlayStation Someone might say, I need an iPhone. Someone might say, I need this. I need a car. I need a house. The women will tell you, I need a kitchen that's automatic. I look at the biscuits and they're made. <laughs> you know, you look at the recipe book and next thing it's coming out of the oven. Allahu Akbar, I'm waiting for that kitchen. You want it? Just go to Jannah, you'll have it. But to be honest with you, everything we can think about, none of it is going to be in paradise. Do you know why? whatever we as man can make use of is from the earth look at your clothing where's the cotton from the earth look at your watch where's the leather from the earth look at your glasses where's the plastic and the glass from the earth look at the gold where's it from the earth there is nothing that man has used yet that comes from anywhere outside the earth so man you really don't know what's waiting for you subhanallah because think of the best in your mind Believe me, it's only from the dirt of this earth. It's come from somewhere within. Allah has provided it for you. Amazing. So remember, never be deceived. There is something to come. Prepare for the day. Allah has given us news in the Quran about what is to come. And the third type of verses in the Quran are the verses where rules and regulations are made. So those are the three types of verses. One about the past one about the future and one about the present how to deal with one another what to do and so on rules and regulations when you dispute and even at times of ease what is so difficult about the Quran why is it we find ourselves so far away from it may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us steadfastness remember the month of Ramadan is round the corner I think about 40 odd days remaining for Ramadan please I plead with you this time we want to know the meaning of the Quran you know how easy it is we don't have an excuse as technology progresses or should I say as man is becoming more lazy technology is progressing to the degree that we don't have an excuse not to know certain things 
Today, people are lazy to read books, isn't it? So now you have a CD. Today, people are lazy sometimes to even put a CD in so it's on your phone. And sometimes people are lazy with that as well. So as you're flicking your television, you are going to sit there anyway. It's on the one of the channels. Allahu Akbar. We did not have Islamic channels up to very late. And now that we have them, do we make use of them? My sisters, not only the recipes are important, but the recipe to get to Jannah is also important. Mashallah. And the brothers as well. Not only your vehicles and your properties and so on. Mashallah, that is to do with the dunya. But you need to build your property in the akhirah. And the way to do it, you know how we read the newspapers every day for the classifieds, the adverts to make sure that the deal we want, if it's there, we pounce on it before everybody else. We need to also read classifieds that will take us to purchase the home in the akhirah. Every time you read the Quran, remember you're building your home in the akhirah. Seek Allah's forgiveness. Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Turn to Allah because if we don't, Allah says we replace you with others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who understand the beauty of the Quran. As I said, I've only touched on one aspect. Otherwise, the Quran is full of beauty. And really, we are so fortunate to be from the ummah of the Quran. What a flawless book. Absolutely no contradiction whatsoever. No matter what people might try and say, there is always an answer to it. And it is always quite clear and manifest. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who understand his book. And may he make that book bear witness for us and not against us. And may that book be a means of our entry into paradise. And never should it be a means of our entry into hellfire. The hadith I mentioned earlier, the translation of which is, Allah uses the Quran to lift certain people and uses the same Quran to drop certain people. I leave you with a question. Which category do we fall in? وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سبحان الله بحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك